The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. So, um, today we have a very exciting presentation and Brandon Allen, he's a chef and he's going to be doing a presentation on talking about the synergy between cannabis and manipulating the uh, endocannabinoid system and a ketogenic diet which is uh, basically a high fat, low carbohydrate diet and you'll learn more about that with Brandon. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Introducing Chef Brandon. Very good. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to y'all who came out tonight. I appreciate it. So, so uh, as Caitlin said, I'm a chef. Uh, I recently won the first ever High Times Top Cannabis Chef Cook-Off, which was an amazing experience and has opened a lot of doors for me and I've met a lot of great people and is why I'm actually here today. Um, but I'm also a classically trained chef. I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh where I studied culinary arts and <clears throat> I had a really unique opportunity while I was in school to create my own apprenticeship with a chef that is on the Olympic culinary team and is also a certified master chef. And uh, from there, I'm also an interpreter. So an interpreter is essentially the sommelier of cannabis. So I have the ability to identify uh, flower quality and effects based off of aesthetics and the aromatic profile. So basically, my entire life revolves around food and flower, or cannabis, okay? Uh, however, not too long ago, I didn't necessarily understand how food affected my body on a scientific level, nor did I understand how flour affected my body on a, can of, or on a scientific level. So I dove into this research project of my own. Uh, and the research, you know, it went from reading one thing to the next, one video to the next, and now I'm down this giant rabbit hole, and I hope it never ends because I love it. And it has completely changed the way I look at health and wellness and medicine and diet, okay? And all the research inspired an experiment, which I'm going to share with you this evening, my findings, and all the research that <laughs> has gone into this. And also, I'm going to talk about my entire personal transformation. That is my major intention here this evening with this conversation, is to share with you my transformation and what's happened to me, and the amazing parallels of cannabis and ketosis, and what I'm calling the true entourage effect. <clears throat> so. To get started, I think the best thing to do is to explain how and why I started this transformation in the first place. And it really all stems from complete, utter chaos. Chaos within medicine, nutrition, diet, health, wellness, food, everything you could possibly imagine within these spaces here. You know, uh, complete disorder, turmoil. And it was the reason why is because. Over here, I've got one person telling me, go vegan, go vegetarian. Or I have another person saying, do paleo. And then someone over here is telling me to go gluten-free, or to do this, or sugar-free. And there's all these different things. And nothing that anyone was explaining to me or telling me to do made sense to me. Okay, So I basically ended up throughout this chaos becoming this. So this is me a year and a half ago. Obviously, there's a couple changes since then, which has been awesome, and I'm here to share with you how I got from there to here. <clears throat> now, this photo, or these two photos here, may not look to some as personal chaos. You know, this might look like, oh, that's just a normal guy. But to me, this shape, physically, internally, everything here was, a, was chaotic. I was sick, I was unhealthy, I was depressed, and I had chaotic symptoms to, to back it all up. And the majority of what we're looking at here, everything stems from this, chronic pain. I have decreased lordosis, which means that my back, instead of having that nice curve towards my stomach, goes straight down. 
All right. So when I was nine years old complaining about back pain and the doctor told me to lean down and look for the S, all they had to do was tell me to turn this way. And that could have possibly alleviated a lot of suffering with proper physical therapy back then. So since then, I have a herniated disc, fast arthritis, degenerative disc disease. So every step I take, my discs are just grinding away. And then I also have severe uh, joint issues, seven dislocations in my knee. I had uh, corporal tunnel tendonitis, wrist surgery. So on the pain and the physical side, that then started affecting me internally with all these mood disorders, depression, stress, anxiety, you know. My back would go out, I'd miss out of work, I'd be stressed over finances, which would make me anxious of when my back's going to go out again. Uh, the anger and irritability issues from taking pharmaceuticals that were not good for me and then coming off of them was absolutely terrible. So I was a complete mess, basically. And I finally just had a, 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 an, enough. And I stumbled across this by Neil deGrasse Tyson. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. And this really stuck with me because science doesn't give what your opinion is. Because in order for it to be called science and to be called a fact, there are so many things that have to happen to get to that point. The scientific method and all the theories and all the experiments and everything to say this is fact. So I was thinking about this and I was thinking about diet and health and wellness and I basically wanted to find the science of how I could treat myself. And when I started looking at all the various diets from vegan to vegetarian to visitarian, natatarian, pescatarian to paleo, and then I discovered the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet basically told me if I did one, two, three, then four, five, six is going to happen. Most people, including myself, just wanted four, five, six to happen and weren't willing to go through what they needed to do for that one, two, three. So here's the ketogenic diet in a nutshell. One, two, three. It is a high fat, moderate protein, low carb macro intake. And when you consume this macro, what happens is you deplete your body of carbohydrates or glucose. And when you deplete your body of carbohydrates and glucose, your body needs another fuel source. We have the ability to then burn our stored fat for this energy source to fuel ourselves. When our body starts burning fat for energy, it produces ketones versus acetoacetate, then beta hydroxybutyrate, and then acetone. And then all three of those actually do work synergistically together. This is a complete transformation to your metabolism. So let's break down each of these individually to go in a little bit more detail because it's not just any fat, any protein, and any carb. It's very specific, okay? So in the world of the fats, we're looking at uh, basically coconut oil, MCT oils, avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, and then we're looking at butter and clean, very clean animal fats like lard and mallow. Okay? Uh, what's important about the fat is that just by default, by consuming those things within the ketogenic diet, you are forced basically to consume high omega-3 rich fats. So we evolved at this ratio of omega-6 to 3, about a 3 to 1 to a 1 to 1. You know, it really depends on the article and the, the era of which they're referencing. But in that ballpark is how we uh, evolved eating omega-6 to omega-3. Now, with the American diet or the world diet at this point for the majority of uh, major countries like the United States, we're at more of like a 20 to 30 part omega-6 to 1 part omega-3. We are not even just a little flipped, we are just far gone, okay? And the inflammatory effects of omega-6 fats is just destroying health, okay? So from the fats, you now go to the protein, which you want to eat proteins that have good fats. Forget about chicken breast, go for the chicken thighs, all right? You don't worry about the tilapia, let's go for the salmon. It's got better flavor and uh, better DHA omega-3 anyway. So in the world of the fats as well, we're looking at a very, very high ratio of DHA omega-3. DHA omega-3 is the, the building block of our, of our brain, of our neurotransmitters, of our cell receptors, our cell membrane. I mean, it, it is everything that we need. It is incredibly important for our diet. And a lot of people are deficient, which is causing a lot of issues as well. And in the world of the proteins, you know, free metabolic hormones is pasture-raised organic. Basically, uh, one of my favorite things that I heard from Dr. McCullough is the RAP, Replicate Ancestral Practices. Okay, so when you think about the ketogenic diet, think about that. 
All right, the foods that were available to us before agriculture and even before uh, the um, processing foods and all of that. So, and then we get to our carbohydrates. So you're saying goodbye to your bread, you're saying goodbye to your sugar. No more gluten, no more grains either. Okay, so you're basically getting your carbohydrates from vegetables that are high in fiber, so leafy greens, cauliflower, broccoli, spinach, things like that, and stay away from the fruit as well because fructose is a completely different ballgame, especially when you're looking at your carbs there. Um, and then when you do this, you end up in ketosis. And there are a couple different types of ketosis. What we're looking for is nutritional ketosis. And what nutritional ketosis means is you are still consuming calories and you're still feeding your body the macros that it needs to sustain itself. Starvation ketosis is essentially what a bear does. Okay, so if you just stop eating, that's going to turn into star starvation ketosis, and then you're going to start breaking down protein and you're going to wither away. So what a bear does is it stocks up on a bunch of fruit and uh, various berries and things like that, and tons of salmon, all those really good fats, and it packs on the pounds, and uh, it sleeps and it burns its stored fat. And that's the whole idea on the weight loss side and why my transformation is that when you manipulate your system this way and you end up burning fat, you burn your stored fat as well, not just what's consumed. And that's why I've shrunk as much as I have. And then the last one here is ketoacidosis. Basically, if you're a type 1 diabetic that doesn't uh, maintain your blood levels, your blood sugar levels, you can go into ketoacidosis. If you don't have a pancreas that's not producing insulin, you can go into ketoacidosis. But it's a very, very, very small percentage of the population that would ever have to worry about this, okay? But if you go and type in keto online, I guarantee within 10 seconds, you're gonna see someone's blog talking about how ketoacidosis is the worst thing in the world if you do keto and do the ketogenic diet. I assure you, as long as, like I said, you don't have those issues, you'll be in good shape. Now, I know that this looks like a lot because you're getting rid of the sugars and the gluten and all these and high fat and low carb and it's the complete opposite of what most people are eating, but I eat like a champ, okay? Now, these tortillas here, I eat two tacos all the time because this tortilla company, it's about 10 grams of net carbs per tortilla uh, and it's a cost of coconut flour, so it's a lot cleaner and healthier option. Uh, but I do a lot of grilled vegetables, tons of eggs, you can see all these vegetables. I mean, this this is not like a chore, okay? <laughs> this is not a diet that I've ever thought of. Uh, it's more of a lifestyle. Um, I do dairy occasionally here and there. Uh, that really depends on the person that's doing keto. Salmon, my absolute favorite. Oh, I just I'm actually getting hungry now, staring at everything. <laughs> so uh, I love to cook. I love to eat. And. At this point, when I'm you know, enjoying this high-fat diet, and I started to shrink down, I was about six months into it, and I ended up moving to California. And when I moved to California, I was basically introduced to the true California state flower, which is not the California poppy. <laughs> this is the true California <laughs> state flower, okay? Um, sorry for any diehard California poppy fans out there. Uh, but I was basically reintroduced to marijuana as an adult and as a medicine. Not the swag weed that had seeds in it that I was, you know, 14 getting high and listening to 311 playing my guitar. Okay, a lot has changed since then. So this was introduced to me as a medicine. And when I, I started consuming, I basically started feeling better. All those symptoms you saw earlier, a lot of them started to minimize. So my back pain minimized, okay? My flexibility even got better my inflammation reduced, all right? And then I slept a lot better and my irritability went down, okay? So I started to experience these really, really amazing benefits. And I was buying store-bought or dispensary-bought edibles at that time because I really didn't like to smoke too much. And I realized that the ingredients in this medicine are all the very things that I despise and that are hurting and causing inflammation and causing disease mixed with medicine. So I wanted to learn how to make my own cannabis products, okay? So what I did is I started researching how to determine flower quality. Because as a chef, I like to work with the cleanest ingredients that I can get my hands on and that I can afford, okay? When it comes to flour, I looked at it the same way, especially because this is specifically a medicine. So I did some research. I ended up finding an organization that trains interpreters, okay? So think terpene, the essential oils of the plant kingdom, uh, interpreter interpreting. So it's the art of uh, basically identifying 
flower quality based off of the physical structure and appearance and the aromatic profile. So if you had flour right now and you handed it to me, I would basically look at it up close and then I have, if I had a little jeweler's loop, I would get close and look at the trichome, how all these beautiful little uh, hairs or crystals that people call them on there. And then I would smell the flour and be able to tell you if it's good quality, where it falls into the indica to sativa spectrum, and then based off of the aromatics, how it's going to make you feel. Is it going to be an uplifting euphoric high that you're gonna do before you clean the house all day or before you go to a concert? Or is it going to be the mellow indica relaxing couch lock? And that's what an interpreter has the ability to do. So since I was basically falling in love with this plant, I'm experiencing major benefits from it. I then wanted to better understand the science of how it works. Cause I knew a lot about keto but I didn't know too much about this flower. So I started doing research and you know, I'm, I'm reading one website. And then a couple of clicks later, there's another website that's telling me the complete opposite of this one. And then I found another video blog that's got a couple million views. And then another one with a couple million and complete opposite information. It was misinformation. And a lot of I now know is completely outdated or just lies, just complete false information that when I went to the sources of the people who were truly doing the research throughout, very, throughout the world, I found the, that a lot of this stuff is just mind-boggling that people can come up with. So I started going to more legitimate research, and I was looking on Amazon for various books and whatnot, and when I did, I found this uh, Amazon Prime free article. You know, and I saw that you know this guy's got a couple things after his name, so he's a lot different than the uh, the you know Bob's Pop blog that's sitting there bashing CBD because he doesn't understand the science of it. And this paragraph right here is one of the most important paragraphs of my my life as of right now. And I I can't wait to find another momentous paragraph. I'm excited about that. But this might seem very very basic, but this turned on a light bulb and connected a dot with me that I and just beyond thrilled to have had happen. So this first sentence here or two, people are generally aware that omega-3s are good for you and they inhibit various cardiovascular problems. What most people are not aware of is that they participate directly in the endocannabinoid system and that they make a variety of our endocannabinoids and they are a part of the bigger picture of lipid metabolism of which the endocannabinoid system is kind of a central focal point. So, I saw omega-3s and I thought ketogenic diet, okay? Endocannabinoid system, omega-3s, the, the variety of our endocannabinoids are built on these and this just got me so fired up. And I started researching a couple more things and I finished this book and I read another one by Stephen Leonard Johnson and I saw this connection to cannabinoids and the benefits with the ketogenic diet that I've been doing for quite some time and those very same benefits. So, this eventually inspired a theory. My theory is that the ultimate state for the human body is to be in nutritional ketosis while supplementing the endocannabinoid system with phytocannabinoids from cannabis. This theory then inspired an experiment that I did for 30 days. This past April, I decided for the first time in my life that I was going to take complete control and the most discipline that I've ever experienced ever. And what I did is 100% strict keto by following these macros, okay? And there are various macros, some will say 75, 20, and 5, or 80, 10, and 10, you know, vari variations, depends on the person, but I follow this macro. I have absolutely zero cheat days and no alcohol for the first time and gosh, I mean, I was 31 when I did it, probably 17, 18 years old, would have been the last time that I went 30 days without alcohol. I, will, I didn't exactly have the best habits before I started this transformation, okay? But then I started consuming omega-3 DHA, specifically non-pharmaceutical grade. I use a company called Sea Rich, and um, they're coming from sardine, anchovy, and mackerel, and I was eating a lot of low mercury seafood. So sardines, anchovy, mackerel, uh, salmon, things like that. And then I started using CBD, cannabidiol, 30 to 50 milligrams a day. Now, this is not a cannabis event, but if we were and I asked how many people use CBD, probably less than half the room would actually raise their hand. Which I think is mind-blowing that there's a lot of people in the industry that they don't use it because they might not necessarily know how 
it actually affects them or think that it truly will have the benefits that everyone thinks it's hyped up about. This is the miracle molecule, I assure you, this, across, across the, the globe, across everything. And then I started doing more low and slow doses of THC during the day. I'm looking at you know, two and a half to five milligrams with my fat coffee in the morning. Uh, no, no, nothing psychoactive whatsoever. And then my higher doses in the evening to aid with the back pain. Um, one thing is cannabinoids can alleviate pain, but they can't fix broke. My back is crooked. Okay, So this pain that I have, cannabis helps alleviate significantly. But it doesn't get rid of it. It's not just like... I'm, Okay, I said it's the miracle molecule, but there are limitations, all right? Um, and then I also started consuming terpenes, uh, doing the diffuser, as well as adding it to my food, and then adding isolated terpenes onto my flour vaporizer to essentially create my own effect. You know, I could take any strain and add the additional terpenes to it and change the, the psychoactive effects of it. By doing this for the 30 days <clears throat> and doing all this research, I then wanted to dive into what the endocannabinoid system was and how all of this, based off of my theory, was going to make sense. So I really dug into the endocannabinoid system. Now, I'm going to follow this timeline here. And I was thinking about it earlier today as I was going through this, and I remember having timelines and you know, history and things like that as a kid. Um, this is the most exciting timeline that I've ever had to, <laughs> had to work with. Very exciting. Now, we all have an endocannabinoid system, all vertebrates, okay? Let's start in 1963. 1963 is when Dr. Raphael Meshulam and his team isolated CBD or cannabidiol, okay? In 1964, they finally isolated THC, this wonderful psychoactive molecule. And what was great is they, they isolated it in the lab and he brought it home and gave it to his wife and she actually baked a cake and put it into the cake and you have these young scientists that are hanging out in 1964 and, uh, and he, in an interview with him he was explaining that you know about an hour or so in everyone started to feel a little bit different. Uh, so in the name of science they enjoyed a wonderful edible. Um, now, since we found the molecule okay, that was causing these psychoactive effects, they basically then needed to figure out why. What was this molecule doing and how is it affecting our system and where? So in 1988, the CB1 receptor, the cannabinoid 1 receptor was discovered. And because they finally found where this tiny little molecule would bind to to have these psychoactive effects, and they found this receptor within the body, that tells them that if we have something within the body, they can be activated by something outside the body, exogenously. Then we also must have something in the body that binds to the same receptor, or activates the same receptor. So they went on the hunt. And in 1992, they discovered anandamide. So ananda, or is uh, bliss, the bliss molecule, it's Sanskrit for bliss, is associated with runner's high. Now I've never ran much in my life beyond like soccer, at least long distance, but I've heard many people say they've experienced runner's high before. That is your endocannabinoid system helping you out. You're mile 10 of that marathon, mile 11, 12, 15, whatever it is, and you're destroying your body, you're exhausted. So the endocannabinoid system, and the whole purpose of it is to achieve homeostasis, releases an anandamide and says, here you go, this will help you get through it. Okay? So that is an anandamide. <clears throat> and then in 1993, we discovered our CB2 receptor. Okay, and the CB2 receptor is more in our organs, our peripheral nervous system. Think CB1 more of the head and CB2 more of the body. Okay, but there are these receptors in the brain as well and, and mixed together. <clears throat> now, in 1995, they discovered 2AG or 2 arachidonic glycerol. Okay, my, my favorite thing about 2AG is that it's found in the breast milk of all mammals with incredibly high levels found in humans. So your first meal had cannabinoid supplementation. What's also fascinating is that breast milk has a lot of DHA omega-3, and it also has ketones. So when I found that out, I was like, wait a minute, through this research, there's some really interesting connections there, that a brand new newborn baby would be fed cannabinoids, ketones, and omega-3 fatty acids. Now, 1998 is when they were discovering and, and kind of studying more about 2-AG, 2-arachidonic glycerol. 
And I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit here. But So this is the endocannabinoid system. This system is very old. Okay. They estimate that it's over 600 million years old, and the reason why there's these little primitive organisms that are orthologs, that, uh, let's see, there's nematodes and sea squirts that have, you know, they're all way down at the bottom of the ocean somewhere, I'm guessing, it's a really, really dark place, and they actually have a CB1 receptor. And then the CB2, they expect, scientists expect it to be the most recently mutated, so it is developed the most uh, in modern history, at least what we know of, okay? So I'm really curious, what these receptors will look like in a couple thousand years from now. We won't be around for that, but hopefully by educating people on this, this will still be around and the education will, will be around. <clears throat> so we have this system that these exogenous cannabinoids bind to. So once I understood more about the endocannabinoid system, I wanted to further look into the molecules found within cannabis. Now, within the cannabis species, there are approximately 540 different phytochemicals, so plant chemicals. Of that, I have this broken down into the three main, which would be the cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids. And then we have all these other things that are, that are found in just basic plant material. <coughs> now, the cannabinoids all start with cannabigerol. That is the, the mother cannabinoid. And then from there, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol is created, cannabidiol, and then a whole list of other ones. But then it expands this way. So from in the THC category, it actually starts with THCA, and then becomes THCAB, and then THC, THCBA, which is delta 9 tetrahydrocannabibarin, and then goes all the way to the end, which would be CBN, which is the uh, older degraded form of THC. Now, uh, this, this goes on for the, there's 18, and you can see there's 140 of them. So there's a lot. And now the cannabinoids, they bind with various cannabinoid receptors. Some do, some don't. Even if one doesn't, like CBD, for example, has such a very, very low, low, low affinity for these receptors, it modulates how other cannabinoids work together. But the main that we're going to be, you're going to be seeing in dispensaries and whatnot are CBD and THC, and then the various components of them. Terpenes, of the 20,000 that are found in the plant kingdom, there's about 200 that are found in uh, cannabis. Now, pinene is the most abundant terpene that there is in the plant kingdom, right next to limonene. Okay, so they think pine trees and think lemons. All right. Now, what's interesting is pinene and limonene are what you would associate a sativa strain with, for that more uplifting euphoric effect. Whereas myrcene and linalool would be that more couch lock and sedative effects. And terpenes are essentially essential oils, okay? So anyone who has one of those diffusers, uh, they could actually be possibly stimulating their endocannabinoid system depending on what they have in there, all right? And in the world of aromatherapy or with terpenes, there's a lot of uh, naysayers, okay? That, oh, aromatherapy is not a thing. And the way I look at it is I have smelled things before in my life that have made me gag and vomit. So if something can have a negative effect on you, why can't it have a positive effect? And I think that that just kind of gets rid of the argument, okay? There's a lot of science that has to go into this, but it's happening. Now, flavonoids are what give the, the plant its uh, color and characteristics, or the polyphenols are abundant. There are some that are specific to cannabis, and then the abogenin and the luteolin and these other ones that are found all across the plant kingdom, and then we have these other guys here. So there's a lot going on within this plant. And the whole concept of this presentation is the true entourage effect. So the entourage effect in the cannabis industry right now is looked at as basically consuming whole flour because of all those 540 imaginable cannabinoids that are in it, or imaginable phytochemicals that are in there, is a lot more effective than consuming one isolated molecule by itself. So this is THC. THC is amazing. It does amazing things, it has amazing benefits. Let's say it does this much. But once you start adding CBD to the equation, now it goes to here. And now you add limonene to the equation, and it goes up to here. And submersine, it goes to there. And then all those other flavonoids. And they all synergistically work together to enhance each other's effects. But the entourage effect 
is something that I, I was really intrigued by because it made sense to me. And I was thinking about my diet as well, and you know, certain foods work synergistically together. But I was curious about where this came from. So I did a little research and I wanted to find out who coined this, this term or what happened. And I'm expecting to honestly like find a video uh, from like the 60s or something of some dude in flip-flops and dreads down to here talking about the entourage effect, man. But it actually wasn't the case at all. It was originated within our own body. So the whole concept of the entourage effect actually stems from 2-AG, or 2-Arachidonoglycerol, our second discovered endogenous cannabinoid. And in this research paper here, this study with Dr. Raphael Mishulam and his entire team here, <clears throat> basically they were looking at 2-AG. <clears throat> and they found that every time the endocannabinoid system would release 2-AG, there were these other cannabinoid-like molecules that were present. But those molecules themselves did not bind with the receptor or activate the receptor the way 2-AG does. So they isolated them and they separated them. And then they released some 2-AG on there and it had a much weaker affinity for the cannabinoid receptor. So then they slowly started reintroducing these other cannabinoid-like molecules and the affinity increased and it was a lot stronger. So the entourage effect actually stems from within us, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. But because of that, and seeing how you know the endocannabinoid system, it's not just 2-AG and anandamide, there's other metabolites, secondary metabolites from there. And they might be secondary, but they have a major purpose. Okay? So I was really, really fascinated by this, and my research continued. And as I said earlier, my research throughout my experiment here did not stem from Bob's pop blog or from you know, Karen's keto Instagram or YouTube page. I was reading Nature Neuroscience and I'm reading Frontiers of Psychology, all these published peer-reviewed medical journals. And I'm a chef with a two-year culinary degree, okay? I am not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, and nor do I claim to be. So I really had to train myself to be able to understand these medical journals. I would start reading this one, and I get like three paragraphs in, and next thing you know, something stumped me that, you know, a quick little double click, look up and read the definition didn't satisfy. So I, then I, I look up and I end up to this one. And then from there I got stumped, so I would end up reading something over here, and then find my way back to this one, finish it, and then be so blown away by it, then I'd pick up this one, and then I'd be right back to here, and then finishing this and this and that. <laughs> so this, was, this has basically been my, since April, I've been really actively reading the medical journal side. And I love it. I absolutely, absolutely love it, because, again, like I said in the beginning, it's science, and that's what's fascinating. Now, throughout the research, of cannabis and ketosis is when I started to find all of the nutritional and medicinal parallels of the two. So everything on this slide and the next one, every single thing here. Being in ketosis, I've read medical journals or research that say that the ketogenic diet and being in ketosis will help with. It. it will either prevent, alleviate, or cure. Okay? On the cannabinoid side, the exact same thing. So, and th this is minimal because allergies, I'm pretty sure that there's not just one word for allergy. There are tons of allergies, okay? Acne, there's various different um, skin disorders. You know, it's an anti-nausea. Well, what's causing that nausea? Cellular damage, where? Cancer, where? What? What type, okay? So I can expand this further and further and further. But I'm going through here, I'm looking at all these things that I was actually experiencing. I've seen all these things that family members were experiencing, and it absolutely drove me crazy that here I am, a chef that's reading these medical journals and, and aligning these things and seeing these parallels. And part of me was angry that, that not everyone knows the benefits of this, okay? But then I realized that I have to take the leap and be one of the people who's going to help educate and, and share the good green words, so to speak. Now, as I continued the research, there was certain aspects and certain benefits of cannabis and ketosis that I saw over and over and over, especially for mitochondria function, metabolism, uh, inflammation, neuroprotection, immune support, gene expression, which is like super exciting the more I'm learning about neurology, but cancer. I mean, nothing 
really gets much worse, I think, at this point than cancer, okay? Uh, and the Center of uh, Disease Control said that in 2016, they estimated about 1.68 million new people would be diagnosed with cancer, and of that 1.6, about 600,000 of them will die. So about 35% of the people diagnosed with this disease die. Those odds are not good, okay? So as technology and medicine and science and all these things are just expanding, our health and wellness is decreasing, and it makes absolutely zero sense to me. I, I don't understand how the powers that be, or whatever it may be, can allow this to happen. But I now know, after all this research, what's actually causing these things. And it really has to do with every single thing that you put into here. Every single thing we put in here modulates those functions, okay? And can prevent, or possibly even cure. Now, 50% of worldwide cancer will increase in the next 13 years, 13, 14 years. The deaths will increase 60%. How, again, is that possible with all this science and technology? And really, it comes down to food, and it comes down to whole, clean ingredients. So, as I'm stumbling across cancer, at the same time as when I came across the Warburg effect, so Dr. Otto Warburg, in 1924, had a theory that cancerous cells or mutated cells get stuck in this anaerobic lactic acid fermentation cycle that normally would be a short-term thing and then your body goes right back to aerobic. But it gets stuck there. And these cells just start eating glucose, eating sugar galore. They are gobbling it up. Okay, and then they mutate and they uh, split and they create more bad cells and or kill other cells. It is, it is terrible. And every person in the scientific community laughed at him. They said he was crazy. And then DNA was discovered about in the 50s and he was 54 and people still laughed at him. And they're like, oh, it's got to be genetics. It's got to be genetics. Well, it's not that easy. After all the research they've done on, on genetics, it's, it doesn't mean that if your dad or mom has cancer that you're going to get cancer. But look at the habits of dad and mom, and then the habits that are passed down. That might have a lot more to do with it. You know, there's, there's, there's synergy there between those, those two theories. So as I'm researching more about cancer, because I think that this is such a terrible disease, I find that ketones can starve cancer cells. Okay? So when you deplete your body of glucose, so you don't have to worry about that glucose lactic acid fermentation cycle that Otto Warburg was talking about, you deplete the glucose, you can starve cancer cells. Now this does not mean that all cancer cells. There are various types of cancer cells, okay? But from the journals that I've read and the, and the information I've found, it has an amazing benefit. But it's not just starving the cancer cells, it's all of the other positive metabolic changes that happen while being in ketosis that strengthen your immune system, they strengthen everything, okay? So I'm looking at ketones, I'm like, well, you know, at the parallel that I'm going down here, if, uh, you know, ketones can start cancer cells at work, I'm curious what cannabinoids can do. And this is when I realized that cannabinoids can induce apoptosis. So apoptosis is natural programmed cell death. It's your body's way to say, hey, bad cells, we're getting rid of you, without hurting the good cells, okay? So cannabinoids can do that very same thing. They can get rid of bad mutated cells or weak cells, okay, without hurting all the good ones. So think about chemo. Chemotherapy basically destroys all cells. It doesn't care whether you're, you're good or bad or mutated or not. And the first forms of chemotherapy and the inspiration behind it stem from mustard gas. So let's go to war, destroy our enemy with this mustard gas. Translated to, oh, huh, let's inject this into someone's body and see what happens. And there's a book called Tripping Over the Truth that talks about Otto Warburg and talks about this whole entire process. I would highly recommend. And it is just nauseating to think that that was a legitimate concern or, or, or idea. So um, cannabis, ketosis, killing cancer. But what about the everyday ailments that we all suffer from? The things that we have come to know as the norm. 
sleep, de depression, sleep issues, depression, anxiety, all these, all these little things are digestion issues or skin issues, things that aren't as life-threatening as cancer, but we deal with it. And we have basically thought that this is normal. I thought a lot of these symptoms that I was experiencing were normal for quite some time. All right? So I wanted to see if I could find a possible way to be able to measure the effects of cannabinoids and how they affect our body. And that was at the same time that I met Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Smith. Now, Dr. Smith is a retired anesthesiologist. He's from, uh, he, he worked at the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the greatest hospitals in the country. And he is now a medical marijuana practitioner here in San Diego. <clears throat> so we met in an event because I said, ketosis and his ear perked up because he's been doing the ketogenic diet for quite some time and at 75 years old it is looking really good and is in great shape um, and through our conversations he tells me that he has a bioimpedance machine and he explains that this machine is a non-invasive way to basically measure your overall physiological health your metabolic function so we started talking about this this experiment and ways that we could use the machine with cannabinoids so the reason that the last meeting was canceled was due to this experiment being great, but there was a little bit of an issue. So I'm going to explain this here. Now, as I go through these slides, these are just screenshots of, of what this machine shows. Okay, uh, And I'm not going to get into the detail of this because we're putting all these before and after scans together, putting together a medical journal or, um, you know, a, I guess you could say a a projection of what we've done and what we're looking to do to seek possible funding so we can actually take this to a clinical level. So what this bioimpedance machine does is it measures, like I said, your entire overall physiology and uh, gives you these amazing readouts. And the machine itself hooks up to uh, so two node, uh, electrodes on the head. There's a, plat or a metal plate that you put your hands on, your feet on, and then you have the pulse ox on the finger and blood pressure. And based off of the electrical frequencies that it's sending through the body and how they are able to travel through the body is how it basically determines your metabolic function here. Now, these are certain before and afters. I just took random screenshots, but you can see like the different color in my bladder here, different color in my lung, brain function. Show, so it shows all these different things. And I'll, I'll save this for Dr. Jonathan Smith to explain uh, in greater detail in this report, which we're excited to have put together. But so I, I started doing this experiment where I, my first experiment is when I was in ketosis. I'm at my prime, at my peak, around noon. I've had my fat coffee, <clears throat> and I just, I, that's my best time of the day, okay? And what I did is I did the first scan, and then I consumed a THC strain, and we did a second scan, and we saw the immediate differences in the, in the scan and in the, in the results. So then... What I wanted to do is also shock my system and see how I could recover with cannabis. So one Saturday night, I went out, I ate the way I, and drank the way I used to do about three to four to five or sometimes seven nights a week. I had pizza, I had beer, I had pasta, I had wine, I had a shot. I mean, I did what was the norm for me for quite some time. And the next morning, Hung over, Brandon wakes up, and the machine's portable, so Dr. John came over and we got all set up, and I'm dehydrated, and blah, 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 you know. Did the scan, consumed a THC strain, did another scan, and then a high CBD strain, and did another scan, and the results were awesome. It was really, really cool to see the differences that each one did. Following weekend, did this experiment again, but I flipped them. So I did the CBD, and then halfway through this THC, test, I passed out, just gone. Came to, a couple seconds later, and I've seen all these like weird black specks everywhere, and my vision was all messed up, and I was ridiculously high on top of the fact, because of passing out and just being all messed up. Um, I came to, and passed out again. And at that point, Dr. John grabbed me, and I fell into like a little windowsill, and he grabbed me, and he, when he helped me get to the floor to get my legs over my head, I, my bad knee I dislocated seven times and had two surgeries on. Something happened. It got twisted bad. It was swollen for three weeks. It was terrible. Uh, I thought I actually tore my ACL based off of how it was. And I'm, I'm feeling much better now, but it's still weak. And this is over six weeks ago now. 
Um, and he got my legs up over my head, and he was all freaked out. And when I finally came to, I was just, I don't even know how to explain how I felt, but it was not good. It was terrible. And it took me about five weeks to actually recover from this. And the best way that Dr. John and how I love how he explains it is that I basically had a pharmacological porridge in my system. So I had alcohol that probably wasn't completely metabolized yet. I had shocked my system with gluten and sugar and grains and all these things. I was inflamed. I was dehydrated. And the alcohol is a vasodilator. So my blood pressure started actually around like 139. And then after the CBD strain went to about 105. And after the THC strain, when we did the test in the beginning, went down to 95. So I had all these vasodilators that were just opening up my, my arteries and my heart couldn't basically keep up and keep maintain the pressure. So that's why I passed out because my body said, okay, brain, you're using too much energy. We need to fix everything else that's going on here. Now, one thing, even in the name of science, I will never, ever, ever disrespect my body the way I did for those two experiments again, ever. All right? Instead, I want to help people who are already doing that as the norm get down to where I'm at now. Okay? So you can see more of the images here, some of the before and after, and the difference in colors is, is changes in blood flow, which could basically mean there was inflammation before that was reduced, or you needed blood flow to help, so it was increased. And that's where Dr. John will explain in the report once we release it. Even shows brain function, how your cells are uh, consuming energy, which is increase or decrease, and it's fascinating. And then this was one of those other aha moments. And I am at the AWARE Project, the psychedelic group, so I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with uh, serotonin, okay? And when I saw this, I really got intrigued by the GABA and from things I read about how you know glutamate cytotoxicity is causing all these issues from epilepsy to, to depression and anxiety and leaky gut and neurological issues and how GABA balances that out and then some of the tests we've seen actually show a significant increase in dopamine which was really interesting but the serotonin I was really really curious about. And at the same time, with all this physical transformation that I had gone through, I had some friends of mine that were talking to me about psilocybin. And I was really curious about the neurological benefits to it. And I started basically looking at my transformation. I had to show more food, come on. I looked at my transformation as an onion. And what one day I was thinking about, wow, physically I feel and look great but I still wasn't completely happy with my mental state, okay? So, I was thinking of Shrek in the movie where he tells the donkey that ogres are like onions, and I thought that that was a great analogy. So, basically I peeled off this first layer and I was deciding I needed to make a change. And then I peeled off another layer by actually putting that change uh, into action. And then I lost the weight, I lost 10 pounds, I went to the wedding and I looked great, and you know, I pulled off a couple others, and then I'm left with this heart of the onion. And I never ever would have been able to know about those layers of issues that I had had I not gotten rid of all of these first. But just because I didn't know that those issues were there, that doesn't mean that everyone else in my life didn't know. When Brandon is super irritable and snappy, okay, and angry. You know, I used to walk around thinking, oh, you know, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an asshole just because. And then I saw that there was a major issue in that mindset, okay? And because I lost all these layers, I was able to really dig into the heart of it. And that is when psilocybin became a really important part of my overall transformation, okay? So, microdosing is something that uh, I was experimenting with uh, over the past couple of months, multiple doses. And by microdosing, some may not know, it's nothing hallucinogenic, you don't trip at all. It's just having this neurogenesis that is happening in your body by the psilocybin and the various other effects. So I started reading more about psilocybin and, and the molecules and everything within psychedelics and what I found and what a lot of people were telling me is it helps a lot with you know mood or social disorders, okay, or any type of neurological disorder. So I'm reading, 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 and what I found was neurogenesis. 
And that was what fascinated, fascinated me the most. So it wasn't until the late 90s that we thought that once you hit your early 20s, your brain cells basically stopped growing and then they started dying until you died. And that was it. That you could not create new neurons or kind of like change your, your neuroplasticity, your neuronal network, okay? And when I found out that psilocybin promotes neurogenesis, I was really, really intrigued because the whole idea that you can essentially control your brain, you can, you can grow your brain, you can change it. And that was fascinating to me. So as I'm learning more about psilocybin and reading some of the medical journals, again, I started seeing some really, really amazing parallels to cannabis and ketosis. And one of the things about neurogenesis is just because you create them doesn't mean that they're going to survive. It can take a couple weeks for these neurons to basically be, become part of the, the network and put into tissue and have a purpose. So I'm reading more and more and more and I discover that cannabinoids not only promote neurogenesis, but they promote neuronal survival. And then I'm reading more and I discover that uh, there's a book called The Neurogenesis Diet. And he talks about how bioflavonoids or polyphenols, okay, can aid in neuronal survival. Well, what's amazing is that these bioflavonoids like apigenin and glutaolin are found in cannabis. We saw that a couple slides back. And the food that is included in the ketogenic diet is super rich in bioflavonoids and polyphenols. So I'm, I'm getting further and further excited about the fact that, you know, cannabis has helped me so much, ketosis has helped me so much, and I get to this inner heart of this onion where I have some, some internal psychological, neurological issues that I wanted to deal with, and then I find that all these things about promoting the right outgrowth and neuronal survival just work perfectly with psilocybin and microdosing, okay? But then, this is where I'm super gonna geek out here, all right? I got very, very, very excited because I was reading about PPAR receptors, and then the other day I find that cannabidiol induce, or reduces neuroinflammation but also promotes neurogenesis through these receptors that I just learned that cannabinoids actually bind to. So in addition to our endogenous cannabinoid system, CB1 and CB2 receptors, we have this whole other series of receptors. PPAR, peroxisome proliferator activator receptors. Of the family, we have the alpha, delta, and the gamma. The gamma then is their four subtypes. The gamma is what cannabinoids either are directly binding to, our endogenous cannabinoid secondary metabolites are binding to and activating, or through intracellular signaling, either way, cannabinoids are activating this receptor. And the whole family of receptors, their whole purpose is to regulate energy homeostasis and metabolic function. So the whole purpose of the endocannabinoid system is to achieve homeostasis. Energy, what's going to feed our cells to actually be able to have homeostasis is incredibly important, okay? Metabolic function was on that list of all the things that I was discovering. But what blew my mind was when I found that cannabinoids activating the gamma enhances glucose metabolism. So if you're in a ketogenic state and you consume something that increases your ability to burn off glucose, that means that you're able to then start burning your fat and start producing ketones. So at the same time that it's enhancing glucose metabolism, it's upregulating genes that aid in lipid production to produce better, or should I say, more ketones. So this blew my mind, okay? And on top of these receptors, you know, energy and, and regulating genes, uh, one of the biggest benefits as well is anti-inflammatory. But then I discover that the uh, peroxisome proliferator activator uh, receptor A, uh, or I'm sorry, the receptors, a family of nuclear receptor role in various diseases, and that was really interesting. And then I'm seeing over here that cannabidiol uh, promotes neurogenesis through the PPARY, and then we have that PPARY activation prevents impairments in uh, memory and aids in neurogenesis. 
So all of these things with cannabis and ketosis and the endocannabinoid system and the PPAR receptors all start connecting. And then, of course, I find that they aid in neurogenesis and neuronal survival. Okay, So it's not just the endocannabinoid system. And that's what's amazing about the research that's happening right now is we're finally being able to figure all of this stuff out. All right? and, and not only is neurogenesis new to the science community, two decades old, okay, Cannabis is incredibly new, even though it's been around for, I don't know, 20 million years when it diverged from its ancestral, uh, and pops went one way and cannabis went the other, and it's been domesticated for about 10 to 12,000 years since our last ice age, but who knows how long humans have been actually consuming it or using it prior to the actual domestication. Okay, so just as these cells have evolved and, and these receptors have evolved, we have evolved with this plant. We've also evolved in ketosis and all these good delicious fats. We also evolved with these mushrooms that were growing in the forest that people ate and had mystical experiences. Or maybe they only ate a little bit and just kept them steady. Whichever the case may be, we've evolved with these things. So when I have been thinking about everything with ketosis, everything with cannabis, everything with the psilocybin, this is where I really started to think about synergy again, or the entourage effect, okay? Synergy, the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Ketogenic diet, amazing things. Combine that now with cannabinoids, and now combine that with the occasional psilocybin microdose, or whatever your goals are. I think that this is truly the entourage effect. This is not a synthetic anything. Okay, what you're, this is synthetic. <laughs> These photos here are things that we have evolved with for millennia. Thousands, but millions of years at this point, okay? It's a fish. It gives us really, really good fats, including protein and calcium and a list of other minerals. This is a leaf, and this plant makes a flower that has phytochemicals in it that do wonders for the human body. And this is a fungus, okay? These were not created in labs. This is evolution, or time after time after time, these things have evolved, and we have evolved with them. And I essentially look at the true entourage effect as de-evolving and looking back at what our ancestors used. And even though they didn't, well, necessarily live past 30, because, I don't know, saber-toothed tigers and the plague or whatever else was kicking them out, now we have all these advances in modern medicine, but we can't forget about the ancient and the traditional medicines and the synergy that they have together. So with this true entourage effect of what has completely transformed my life, it's not just a physical transformation here. Because you can see the physical differences. You can even see the physical differences in my dog that turns 14 next week and had Lyme's disease and was dying on my chest one night until I got her to the bed. And after two months of her antibiotic with a ketogenic diet and CBD supplementation, she was taken off of all of her medicine and running on the beach chasing my German Shepherd. And the vet said, I cannot believe that your dog is alive right now. I know why she's alive. It was a combination of modern medicine, the doxycycline, combination of cannabidiol CBD that has been around for who knows, and clean fats, low carb, and the food that she would have evolved in or had available to her if she were wild. So this transformation is not just physical. This complete transformation here is so much further experience with what's within me. And you can't tell what's going on inside. All right? And when these photos were taken on the outside, I looked better and I did feel better. But looking from here to here, you might not see much of a difference physically, but I am a brand new person because of finding the synergy between cannabinoids, ketosis, and now the psilocybin. And I'm going to close with this next slide. And when I pop it up, 
I want you to just sink it in for a minute. Let it sink in. That's the face that I made when I first heard this. Life is suffering. Wow, that is terrible to say. But then Dr. Peterson continued, and he explains that life is suffering. You know, from the moment we are born, things are trying to hurt us. Okay? Disease. Okay? Other things, other beings that are out there. All right? The air that we're breathing. There's all these toxins and toxic things everywhere. And life is suffering. And then he explains that the meaning of life is to find things that minimize that suffering. And to be a good person and to share that good with others. Okay? And this has been really mind-blowing for me to think about because it sounds terrible, but the more I've thought about it and, and kind of just applied it to various aspects of my life, I realized that life is suffering. So all the things that I used to do that I thought were creating happiness, and I thought that by cracking open that eighth beer, I was going to be even happier, or this food that temporarily made me feel delicious, but caused what well, you saw the photos, all these things that I thought were actually good for me were creating more suffering. So a lot of times it's not necessarily what we think is good for us versus what actually is good for us based off of science. So this is motivating for me now to think that life is suffering and what am I going to do to minimize that suffering? And I really, really, really feel that this is one of the most effective ways that we can possibly minimize suffering. And it may not be this for everyone, and it may not be this for everyone, but there's synergy here, okay? And I think it's just, it's, it's changed my life. And when we do a Q&A in a little bit, I would gladly jump into more personal details. I, I'm being incredibly transparent about it. But the way I look at health and wellness and diet and nutrition and medicine and all these things is this. If we have someone who is dying, let's say cancer, from a debilitating disease, and over here, someone is using the ketogenic diet to help maybe just have a better quality of life or to possibly reverse and cure their disease. And then you have someone over here that's using cannabis, and you know this person takes a year, and this person over here with cannabis takes a year to help cure their cancer. Okay? Why don't we combine those together? So instead of a year, maybe it takes five months with these two. Maybe it takes six months or it takes 10 months or even if it takes 11 months and 25 days for that person to finally feel human again and to minimize that suffering, okay? That extra five days of that month that they can have a better quality of life, to me, I look at that as mission accomplished, okay? But then, there's a lot of healing that has to happen after disease. And that's what's fascinating as well about what's happening right now with psilocybin research, is helping people come to terms with tragedy that has happened in their life. I really don't think there's much of a separation between mind and body, the brain and the body. Everything is all connected, okay? What you do physically affects you neurologically, and what affects you neurologically can affect you physically, okay? And these all are helping with, with that whole thing. So it's the whole picture. It's not just the mind and body. It's you. It's everything. So let's combine these together. Let's help save the world with ingredients that have been around way before we have and make a huge difference. I'm Chef Brandon Allen. Thank you. So there you go. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions at all, I will gladly answer to the best I can. Uh, before we get started with that, one thing I would like to say is I'm a chef. <laughs> I am not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist, a nurse. I am not a medical professional. I cannot diagnose, prescribe, or tell you what to do for your health. If I answer any question and I know the answer, uh, consider it, it's me, nothing more than referencing the amazing doctors and the researchers and scientists they have put so much effort into being able to provide the public with this information. All right, so uh, any questions from that? Yes. Um, you're talking about those flowers. Um, Canvas. Yes. 
Okay, well, what if I grow some in my yard and I get some flowers? How am I going to eat them? If you're a chef, how do you prepare them or can you prepare them? Or what do you have to say about that? So in the sense of if you have flour that you're growing in the yard, you want to know how you can consume it. Well, one, you can smoke it, which I'm sure you're quite aware of. You know, if you flush it uh, and you dry it and cure it and the whole nine, uh, you're ready to rock. Um, from that point, you can then take that raw flour that has been cured and you can basically heat it with various oils and extract the fatty lipid cannabinoids and then consume that oil which I have videos for online, and there's tons of stuff online, and there's equipment, like the magical butter machine that you can use to actually do the infusion at home. Or, you can just pick it out of the ground, and you can eat it. That's what I wanted to get at. If you don't want to go through all that rigmarole yeah. stuff, if you just want to eat it, can you just put it in your salad? You can. So the leaves themselves are going to be super rich in those bioflavonoids and the basic you know, leafy greens. Think of any fresh herb, okay? Um, they're not going to have the cannabinoids in it they are going to get you high, okay? However, the leaves do have a lot of beta caryophyll, which is one of the terpenes, and it's a bitter terpene, which is, and the why reason it's down at the lower base of the plant is so that little tiny critter that comes up and wants to take a little taste, now they get this bitter taste and they, they don't want it. It's the plant's natural defense mechanism, which is what terpenes do. Um, but you can, there's a lot of antioxidant properties of the, the leaf matter itself, um, now the flower, so cannabis, they call it, it is a flower, but it's a petalless flower. But it has all the other structure of what a normal flower, like a rose, would have, okay? Um, so the little calyx, which you get clustered, that have the little style stigma that come out. Um, I'll actually uh, pull up here. So all of these little crystals, or what they are called trichomes that you will see on your flower, okay, <clears throat> that's where the medicine's at. That's where the majority of cannabinoids and terpenoids, or, or terpenes are coming from. They're, those terms are used synergistically. Um, these are the, the style, the pistols for the style stigma. So basically this is a calyx, and what happens is if this were pollinated, this is where the seeds would come from. We don't want that though, okay? We want virgin flower. All right. um, but you can take the flower aspect here, and if you really wanted to eat it, and it's going to taste strong, all right, you could grind it up and put it into something. As long as you don't heat it, it's not going to be psychoactive. But the heating aspect of the drying and curing and the heating is, and then smoking it and having that vapor is what makes it psychoactive. It basically converts the, so in the world of THC, so there's THCA, or delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. Okay, which is non-psychoactive, but has a plethora of benefits very similar to THC. Okay, There's a lot of amazing things in the raw flower, but honestly, for if you don't mind the psychoactive effects, I think you're better off consuming it as uh, an infused oil or by smoking. Especially going through all that trouble of growing it uh, in small batches, I would say get the most bang for your buck uh, and, or for your time. For you. Well, I mean, uh, in the sense of consumption, if you do an oil, I think that is the healthiest way. Vaporizing is also incredibly healthy. I try to minimize my smoking uh, for any type of blunt or joint or bong. I don't really occasionally a joint, um, but I have a flour vaporizer. Can you make a tea out You can make a tea, but uh, you will, if you make a tea and you have hot water, you'll be heating this. So it will decarboxylate, or essentially convert that acidic form into the psychoactive form of THC. It just depends on how long it's heated. You know, ideally, you take a flower like this, and you put it into the oven at 230 degrees for an hour to an hour and a half, and uh, that will decarboxylate it. So then you can take that same raw flower that when you have it dried and cured, it's, it's in one stage, then you put it in the oven and it heats it. You can then take that same flower and just eat it, and you would actually get hot. But if you just picked it, dried it, and cured it, and ate it, you're not going to have anything. You have to heat it to activate uh, the or to decarboxylate the cannabinoids. Um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube, and I'm going to be doing a lot more about how to, how to make your own infusions. Um, and there's also equipment out there that you can get to make it really easy. Like I, I said, the, the magical magical butter machine is wonderful. So we can help you. Yeah. yeah.
I don't like getting high, that's why I asked it. it, it okay, so, it, so if you don't like getting high, I don't like that feeling I we used to, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. I don't know. Um, then, yes, you can use the plant and just have all the benefits of the cannabinoids in their acidic form, and there's plenty of them. There's plenty of benefits to it. Yeah. Um, or you can also consume CBD in higher ratios of your THC, and cannabidiol modulates the effects that THC has on you. So let me guess, 50, how long ago did you say? A long time ago? Uh, About 50 years ago. Okay. Cannabis has changed a lot in the past 10 years, let alone yeah. the past 50 years. Yeah. So what I smoked when I was 14, listening to 311 playing my guitar, was probably like 7 to 10 percent THC. Now they're 36 percent. Okay, so it's changed a lot. But did you experience paranoia? And that's what you didn't like about it? No. Um, I, like when I was in college, I didn't. I liked it. I thought it was great. But I don't like the feeling of being, you know, woozy and out of control. I don't like getting drunk either. Okay. You know, that whole feeling, I don't like too much. Yep. So you can get tinctures that have ratios of cannabinoids to them. You just have to take them while well. she has tinctures. She just doesn't consume them. Yeah, but it's it's also having them in, in the right ratio. So you could easily take, say, a, a two and a half to five milligram of THC, but take 10 milligrams of CBD, or three, four times or whatever that amount is that you originally started with THC, and it'll completely modulate. That psychoactive kind of like out of control high that you don't feel that you were in you don't have that cognitive function that you would like to do, which, uh, and a lot of people get paranoid because of that, um, the kind of dial will help modulate, for sure. Well, I was just gonna add, I know that uh, it would turned out that she wasn't looking for THC versus THCA, but uh, um, you can uh, decarboxylate doing uh, black cats, right, with CV. Oh yeah, actually, uh, I for quite some time was using my sous vide machine to do my infusions. Uh, and the reason why is the water bath was at an exact temperature. So I would basically decarboxylate at like 200 degrees for a good hour in the sous vide machine. And then I would, uh, at times I was reducing the heat to like a 180 to do the, the oil infusion. And then I just started keeping it 200 across the board. I did a decar for an hour, two hour infusion. And I had it down to the point where I could, without a lab test or anything, I could take a, a, a dispensary ball edible, 10 milligrams and take that and then have mine measured out to the point where it was essentially feeling right about the same um, with, the, with, with no testing. I, I love the sous vide, I think it's great. You know, if you have the $150 sous vide machine. Yeah. You can also do longer duration, lower temperature if you want. Like, I was basically thinking because she thought, or I thought she wanted the fresh taste of her. But I just like the idea of not having to do any of that not, stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah you'll, you'll still have amazing benefits from the raw flour itself. I mean, chop it up and throw it in a salad, see what happens. Well, I don't have any. I have to grow some first. Yeah. Um, honestly, by the time you go through and grow and all that, go to the dispensary and <laughs> find some THCA and request that you can see the lab test to make sure that it's truly THCA. Uh, do some research on the company because it's incredibly volatile. I mean, depending on how it's stored, you can easily start converting into THC. But it's a very small amount. I mean, I have a company and I have no affiliation with this company, um, but uh, CBD Alive. And they do a whole plant extract of uh, CBDA and THCA. So it's extracted at super low temperatures and uh, mixed with like an MCT oil and some peppermint, and it's it's fantastic. And it was uh, Steep Hill Labs that I originally saw that posted an image of um, THCA activating those PPAR receptors, and that's what kind of influenced my research. And I first thought it was just THCA, and then I read more medical journals about it. It's actually THC, THCA, and CBD, along with our own endogenous cannabinoids. Um, so the other thing with, um, with this whole concept of cannabis and ketosis, if the healthier your metabolism is, the healthier your endocannabinoid system is. And then, the healthier your endocannabinoid system is, based off of everything here I just showed, you'll have a healthier metabolism. So, it, the, the two work synergistically together. Because if you were just constantly bombarding your endocannabinoid system with bad things or creating inflammation and creating disease, and you're consuming cannabinoids on the other hand, they're kind of counteracting. 
You know, so that's my whole thing is, you know, I'm a 100% I'm person. My, I, and sometimes that can be a very bad thing. <laughs> but I found my 100% in the right direction. It's just taken me quite some time. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that this has to be super strict for every single human being. Like, oh, if you don't follow this whole thing serious, you're going to die tomorrow. No, that's not the case. But there's a lot of really sick people out there. And what got them sick is extreme. So curing that is possibly extreme. But I don't think this is extreme. You saw the food. You get to get high and eat fat and protein. <laughs> Come on. I mean, how hard is it? Any other question? Yeah. Um, I want to ask about, uh, you mentioned you use a diffuser and talking about um, some of the terpenes and that. Um, when you're using a diffuser, do you typically use um, whole plant extracts like uh, orange oil or something like that to get dilumine or uh, like lavender oil, or do you actually get um, specific terpenes in your own? Okay, so the question is when using a diffuser, what type of extracts or terpenes do I use? So I have a combination. Um, there's a company that, again, no affiliation, but a company called True Terpenes. Um, they have isolated terpenes that are coming from plants from all over the plant kingdom, not, not cannabis, so it's legal to be uh, extracted and um, shipped throughout the country. Uh, and I will use isolated, so in the morning I like to put a lot of limonene in there because it's that euphoria of it or that uplifting effects of limonene. Uh, where the, like when I get home tonight, I'm probably going to put some uh, beta caryophylline, which actually by smelling it can uh, bind the CB2 receptors and activate my endocannabinoid system even further. Uh, and I'll probably put a little myrcene in there because it's really relaxing. I, and I, I, so there's a lot of, like I said earlier, when it comes to aromatherapy, there's not enough science on it for me to be like, yes, breathe this in, it's going to do this. Versus the actual direct vaporization in concentrated forms, like by smoking or, or actually vaporizing. Um, but the, with, the, with the terpenes, there, there are a lot of journals that I've read that talk about the nutritional or the medicinal effects of them and that these things have happened, but there's not enough hardcore science behind it and how these molecules are binding with their olfactory epithelium and what that is then doing to the brain. And there's, there's a lot I still have to research on it. But, um, I will use whole plant. I had someone give me some actual marijuana extracted terpene, and it was amazing. It was at just the, the smell of it was amazing. Just in the little vial was, was euphoric alone. It was, it was really interesting. So, um, trying to figure out how to phrase this into a question. Um, so, for like about a year and a half, I was pretty much um, ketosis uh, is part of a healing process from Lyme and a lot of right. chronic you know, you know, pain and inflammation, depression, anxiety, insomnia, all sorts of things. And, um, and then as I healed, I started to reintroduce carbohydrates. And you know, since then, I've kind of been oscillating back and forth between kind of a slower carbs and then um, a ketogenic period, and recently, I, you know, I'm really listening to my body, and for about a, a week, you know, I was taking exogenous ketones, and I was, I was very much um, eating a ketogenic, and I found that I actually wasn't feeling good, and so, you know, I, I'm aware of the research, and like, I'm all for it, and, and yet, um, it wasn't really resonating with my body at that moment. Yeah. And, and so, you know, for the sake of not being like dogmatic about any one thing, what's your opinion on, um, you know, ketogenic diet being long term or if, you know, maybe it's ideal for a person's state at one point in their life yeah. and then maybe it's not ideal at another point? Yeah. Because I found I was also feeling more depressed and I know that there's some there's some talk about, well, you know, the carbohydrates help kind of, you know, push the tryptophan, you know, in, into the cells and you know, make more serotonin, but people are not sure if it's actually relevant. What's your yeah. opinion on all that? Um, so the first thing that kind of struck a nerve was when you mentioned exogenous ketones, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I spent this entire time talking about the entourage effect. Taking an exogenous ketone is not the entourage effect. It is not the ketogenic state. 
it, it is not true ketosis. Okay, there are a hundred percent. There are benefits to having exogenous ketone products. These uh, they're salts and esters. Okay, um, research with epileptic patients, research with hyperbaric oxygen chambers and ketones and cancer, and there's a lot of great research to it. But taking an exogenous ketone only gives you beta hydroxybutyrate. Okay? There are benefits to acetone and acetoacetate. You know everyone says, oh, acetone is just like a byproduct that makes your, your breath smell like, uh, like an alcohol vapor. And well, why was I reading in medical journal about acetone having benefits to it? If it's just a byproduct, you know, uh, acetyl, it's, it's this entire shift. So if so I, I experimented with some exogenous ketone products for a while, and I hit this like brick wall, and I stopped taking them, and I could not get back into ketosis. Oh, that freaked me out. I took a break. Um, one had a stevia product, and stevia and I, in, in high doses on it, like I, I, I don't like. I started getting these like really, really bad heart palpitations and I just felt bad. So I stopped and I had the little pea strips, the ketone strips, couldn't for about a week and a half, two weeks. And I was eating hardcore macro keto. No drinking, nothing. And I could not get back into it. So that concerned me. Now, I've read journals regarding exogenous ketones and I think that there's a time and a place for them, but it is, it is not being just because you take a supplement and your pee turns a stick a different color, or it shows that you have this thing in your blood, doesn't mean you're getting the entourage effect of the entire metabolic state of being in ketosis. So there's that aspect there. Um, regarding how you were feeling, you gotta pay attention to your body as you said that you do. Uh, I do this with keto. It's a very, very, I go from like, you know, I'll eat 150 grams, 100 grams of carbs, and I'll be like, totally kicked out of keto and then I'll go super strict and then I kind of go in and out of it and, and a lot of the the big personalities like Dave Asprey and Tim Ferriss and some of the others that are talking about the ketogenic diet a lot of them recommend to do it in little you know a week care and have a couple cheat days maybe four on three off or it depends on what your goals are you know I started off with less than 20 net grams of carbs a day because I had plenty of storage okay I had plenty now I'm between 50 and 100 and I didn't even test my ketone levels. I can feel it. I'm in ketosis right now. I can feel it. My, my vision is enhanced. My hearing is better. Uh, I, 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 can, I, I can feel my voice reverberating through my body. Like, I, I know what I'm in. But my macros are not your macros and they're not your macros. Just like my cannabinoids are not your cannabinoids and they're not your cannabinoids. So it's an experiment essentially. But I would much rather experiment with science and experiment with go vegan. <laughs> I was vegan for two years. I would not recommend it to anyone. Based on now what I know about what our brain needs. One fifth of our brain weight is cholesterol. Don't eat animals. I mean, I agree. Let's treat them with respect and appreciate every aspect to it. You know, you can do a vegan ketogenic diet. It's going to be very difficult though. Because you are going to be taking a ton of algae oil, which will be the EPA oil and convert to DHA. And everyone says, oh, well, I get plenty of omega-3s. I take flax. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear the thing, oh, I don't do heroin. I ate a poppy seed bagel last night. <laughs> I think the Mythbusters did something where you need to eat like five pounds of raw poppy seed to actually have anything show up in you uh, from the right poppy plant as well. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> The ALA side, depending on, your on the person, depending on your liver function, you're looking at like a l less than 1% conversion of that ALA plant-based omega-3 to DHA. You know, ALA doesn't store, it's an immediate energy source. DHA stores, stores in our brain. About two-thirds, what is it? Two-thirds of our brain is fat, uh, anywhere from about uh, a third to half of that. I've, read, I've heard various things anytime we're talking about the fat ratios, but about 20 to 30% of our brain is DHA omega-3. One fifth of our brain is cholesterol. You know, so um, that's why like I've done every diet. I've tried it all. I've, I've done paleo, which is kind of, paleo is this close to keto. The missing link to Atkins is paleo, or uh, missing link to Atkins is keto. The missing link to paleo is keto as well. Because guess what? That sweet potato pie that's made with some grain-free crust 
and it's got stevia and a bunch of maple syrup and it's loaded with carbs sitting there at your desk job. Mmm, eating your paleo. That is not paleo. Paleo is running away from saber-toothed tigers and killing your food. <laughs> okay, you were in ketosis, which is what keep, was keeping you alive. All right, so now, to, to go back, it's an experiment. If you don't feel good, increase your carbs. Okay, if you start feeling better, maintain. If you start feeling worse, well, increase again and see what happens. But it's definitely a roller coaster. Um, and if you think about it, like, think about, um, okay, so you're in a temperate climate. You have two or three seasons, you know, you're going to get cold and high. I'm from Pen Jersey and Pennsylvania, so we have four seasons. Um, when is all of the fruit abundant? In the summer. Okay, and the animals are fat because they're eating all their grains and all their fruit and grass and everything. All right, so you eat all these things in the summer while you're active and you're outside in the heat, so you kind of maintain your weight. And then towards the end of summer, you just start packing on the pounds. It happens to people just naturally anyway, let alone thousands of years ago. When people pack on the pounds or think of a bear, they start packing on the pounds and then this cold weather comes. You know, and you have that insulation to get you through the winter or you have that food that, that to feed your, to your body of those ketones from the fat. You know, so I, I kind of, I, I look at consumption of food based off of seasons, and I think that that's incredibly important to not necessarily, a, like it's a, this huge parallel like everything else I found, but I think that how we used to eat food and the food that was available to us, if we went back to that, we wouldn't have the obesity issues, we wouldn't have uh, a lot of the neurological issues, because people would be eating the right foods that their region is giving them. But that's something I've read and I thought was a really interesting theory. But then the argument is, well, what about people from the tropics and have pineapples galore all the time? You know, so it, it's one of those things where it's hard to really focus on in the sense of like, do this, do that. So do what's right for you and, and take from there. It's the same thing. I mean, if you tell someone, hey, microdose, and they're like, well, it's not helping at all. Well, maybe we need to try a macrodose. <laughs> and then try a microdose and, 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 you know, and, and change things up. Um, I am traveling tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to do my best to maintain keto because I have an event on Saturday where I got to be on my feet. But because I'm going to be on my feet cooking all day, I'm going to have more carbs because I'm going to need it. But I'm also going to have some more fat. But I'm going to be active. And I'm going to be burning that off. So that's another thing. It depends on your activity level. You can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to follow this meal plan and have less than 20 net grams of carbs a day," and then you do the same thing. It's just not, you know. And that's what I love about this is that you can be in a low level of ketosis or you can be in a super high level of ketosis or you can just eat low and slow carb like you were explaining and kind of like throughout the day you might get little benefits of being in ketosis here and there but even if you don't necessarily cross that over if you're depleting your glucose or your glycogen storage before you're starting to consume more and more and more i think that's incredibly important as well yeah that we don't have like this chronically elevated blood sugar yeah. <clears throat> for me i feel like you know um it's easy to kind of demonize carbohydrates because they are problematic because they're proliferate you know like everybody's just their blood sugar is elevated all the freaking time yeah. and they, they never actually switch into these alternate metabolic yeah. states and, and I then think, they become insulin resistant <clears throat> right. or diabetic yeah and so for me like my personal opinion is that the key is um having a body that can be adaptable and oscillate in yeah. between I agree. that's really what makes something a, a human body resilient is the ability to um, cope with whatever is available yeah and so i i don't know i just before i was kind of like yeah ketogenic ketogenic and now i'm starting to see that like um it's really about balancing like everything in life <clears throat> so i hate that word balance because people take advantage of it. Well, I'll bounce out that ice cream with some spinach tomorrow. Right. No, that's, that is not balance. Um, I just looked at myself in that photo and I was standing in the same uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, let's see here. Let's, let's go to that. Let's I, got, I got a little question. You mentioned Atkins, and um, when you were doing this, I was thinking back when I was in. Wait, pause for one second. Balance. Got to find the balance that's for you, but just because you feel good doesn't mean that you are good. And that's where that balance can mainly, a lot of people be psychological, okay? Um, I think that for 
the healthy individual that doesn't have cancer, doesn't have Crohn's disease, doesn't have terrible skin infections and all these things all the time. Yeah, let's keep this balance. Let's go, we're burning glucose today. Hey, you know what, tomorrow we're gonna burn some fat and make some ketones. Or, you know what, I'm on vacation, screw it. And then do your fat coffee, intermittent fasting, super high fat, low carb dinner for a few days and balance that out, I agree. But people aren't balancing. Yeah. Or they don't know what the balance is because of all that misinformation that's out there. And one thing I would like to say as well, if there's anything that I said tonight, that someone can provide me with additional information with signs and facts, not Bob's pop blog, and not you know, Katie's keto page, that can provide me with a different perspective on this or say, hey Brandon, what you said here is incorrect. I want to know that because I don't want to be the product of misinformation whatsoever, okay? Um, based off of everything I looked at, I feel very confident with, with, with what I've put together here. Um, but I'm still learning and I want to continue to learn and if I'm challenged with an opposite side, let's, let's discuss um, or so I can research further and, you know, for camera as well to, to understand that. But, um, yeah, so it's finding your own balance, but there's a lot of science behind that balance, yeah. You were mentioning Atkins diet. Yeah, I just wanted to hear your, uh, your statement about that yeah. because I went on the Atkins diet on, you know, my youth, and, I, and it was the only diet that ever worked yeah. for me, and I felt good on it. But then, you know, it's hard to stay on it. You have to be motivated, and I wasn't obese. My motivation is not going through chemo. Well, I was I'm, young, I'm, I, I, I take that to the that. extreme, but no, that, you're, you're think, right. think those things. But how is yeah. it different? Because that was a long time ago, yeah, so and he got totally poo-pooed out of everything. Yeah, didn't he live to like 95 years old or something? Um, I don't know. I he must have been genetics. I thought he died of cancer though. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was something, but he was so, he was really old, I thought. I mean, well, like, could anyone Google it? He probably was, but the point is he's, he, <clears throat> it, it took a long time before anything good happened in terms of that. Yeah. The society did not accept it. No, so, no, and the reason why is because we were already addicted to sugar. And yeah. from, so Atkins is, you know, a lower carb, but the issue with Atkins was high protein. Excess protein stores as glycogen, which is no different than essentially eating carbohydrates. Yeah, there was a lot of complaining lot, about that. So. A lot of protein. People were like, oh, all I can eat is asparagus and steak. Yeah, that's what I ate well, all the time. No, it's like take that steak portion and cut it down into a quarter or a third. Oh. Throw some coconut oil and butter on there with an avocado and your asparagus, and that's keto. You know, so it's it's the, the issue with Atkins was the protein, and, and I don't think that Atkins focused too much on the right fats either. No, I think I it was like it was yeah. you know whether it was canola, soy, or these various things. And there, oh my gosh, there was something. What is it? The the American yeah, Heart Association yeah. recently did that whole write up on coconut oil being bad for you. Is it the saturated fat? I don't understand no. how that can happen. I just don't get how any organization can say, eat canola oil, which has like next to no omega-3s at all, or eat sunflower oil, or safflower oil, or soybean oil, or well, all it's, these things. It's, it's, it's all money. money. Yeah. It's all money. They don't care about health. Yeah. They care about the money. Yeah. Or they're looking at the, the first cold-pressed macronutrient profile, right. not the overly processed what that oil becomes. Super oxidized. It's super oxidized. Even omega-3 oils can be oxidized and bad for you and harmful. Well, once something gets out, like once an organization that you're talking about makes a statement about this is so good, uh, you know, canola oil especially, every single magazine article that talks about nutrition or food or anything picks up those little things that get it. Where they get it? I don't know. Off the internet maybe? I don't know where they or get it. Just, they get it where you get your scientific papers too, only they're not scientific so much, but they're statements yeah. from an organization, and they repeat it, and pretty well, soon it becomes part of the culture. There's there's a huge uh, politics, not even politics, just shitty people, because there's really good politics out there, just shitty, shitty people, yeah. <laughs> with, I don't know what agenda, I mean, what was it in the, I forget what decade, I'm going to guess, maybe the 70s or 80s? Um, a professor at Harvard, I believe it was, was paid like 50 grand or something, which now is like nothing, but 50 grand to uh, skew the, the studies on uh, sugar and fats. I, I, there's a documentary, um, 
there's a couple sugar documentaries, and one of them's really good. Oh, what the hell? There's the vegan documentary that says that eating sugar is totally healthy for you, but eating that salmon that has those molecules that build your fucking brain <laughs> is bad. But sugar and gluten and grains is totally fine. That's an agenda. It's an agenda. We, we have, as a, as a society, as a culture, we have just, just spit on science. It's mind-blowing to me. It's absolutely mind-blowing to me. But it's our job to hold on to it and hold on to the science that makes sense from various sources, not just one. And it's our job, and I look at it, it's, it's, it's my obligation at this point to get this message out there. That way in, I don't know, 100 years, people are healthy, they're living a long time, and the science and the technology and the medicine and the results of health are all in line. Because right now, it's not at all. And it doesn't make any sense to me. Because we have all the tools that we need, literally, at our fingertips, through Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't wait for the day that we can go, oh, you know, I'm really craving a little, uh, little sativa hybrid here. Do, do, do. Amazon wow. drone drop off. Oh, that's going to be awesome. That's not Let's really do this, Amazon. Far away. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Did you have any questions at all? Uh, just what would you, like you were saying you had your, your macros for the uh, for your keto diet, um, what would you start off with for CBDs or with cannabis? Okay, so again, I'm not a doctor, and right. doctors can't even prescribe, but we can, they can recommend. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, in macros, I mean, are you... Yeah, so um, I am a low and slow. Start low, go slow. Three things can happen when you add something to your diet or to your lifestyle. You get better, you get worse, or you stay the same. If you get better or you stay the same, leave it alone and try that for a while, okay? Then if you don't have any changes after a while, maybe you need to up, okay? But if you try something and you get worse, then you need to reevaluate, okay? So if I, knowing what I know right now, were to, actually, I just recently took a bump three weeks away from everything. Uh, not keto, but I took three weeks away from cannabis. Uh, two weeks, because of what happened. I had the detox. And by detoxing, I actually, and, and you, you abstain from cannabinoids after a certain amount of exposure, um, you can actually regain the density of your cannabinoid receptors and their sensitivity. So before I had this situation where I passed out, I was at a comfortable, 25 milligram edible. Now, I'm back down to about 10 to 15. But I know people that take 200 milligrams. What? 200 milligrams. 200 milligram edible for me, or for you right now, would be like you smoking a blunt this big and that wide. Oh my god. I take because an edible buy, an edible buy is a completely different ball game than uh, smoking high. So, um, what I would do for someone who's brand new and they truly want to track what they're doing is I would use either a, a vaporized pen. Uh, there's a, again, no affiliation, but there's a company called Humble and they do microdosing vaporizing pens. So when you consume, you get a two point, you get a 2.25 milligram dose of their cannabinoid profile, and then they have various pens. There's also other companies that do have these dosing technologies out there. Um, I don't. Experiment too much with them. I'm very happy with the, my my routine that I do, but um, I do like the humble because they have various cannabinoid profiles and various ratios of THC and CBD and whatnot, and terpenes included. So you are getting that entourage effect of that uh, that vape pen, but you know exactly what 2.25 milligrams is going to make you feel, and exactly what 4.5 milligrams is going to make you feel like, and every single time you take a dose, and then. If you're looking for more relaxing and you want to sleep, well, they have one called Sleep and Calm. If you're looking for the more euphoria, one they have one passion, bliss, and arouse. You know, they designed one for a reproductive system, you know, because we have tons of receptors in our re reproductive system. I had someone today ask me how or can cannabis help with my ED? And he's in his late 50s, erectile dysfunction. And not too long ago, I had a, uh, a couple tell me that Every time his boyfriend consumed, 
he had a much better experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's because you got receptors down there and they're doing their work. <clears throat> so I think tracking your consumption is very, very important, okay? Uh, especially on the medical side. So you can determine if you're getting better or getting worse or staying the same and then have measurements within. On the edible side, any edible, I don't care what it is. If it's your first time, you're looking at like three to five milligrams tops. Stop. Don't take any more. If you're not high in an hour, don't take anything. If you don't feel anything at all that night, it doesn't matter. I had an edible the other day. It took three and a half hours to kick in. I have no idea why. It's the same oil that I take all the time. Something with my digestive system, what I ate today, that day was basically preventing it from kicking in. I don't know. But my first edible high, I had someone in Colorado, it was like some sugary root beer thing before I started keto, and they're like, yeah, just drink half of it. You'll be all right with that. Don't drink, you know, be like, if you don't feel anything like, like after an hour, you can drink the rest. Well, I drank half, and I waited a half hour, I didn't feel anything, I drank the rest, and only 10 milligrams? I was high the next morning. I, I was beyond comfortable. And I remember it kicked in, and I was like, oh, man. I want that point where I know, just from getting high when I was younger, it's like, this is, this is gonna go, this is gonna be great or terrible. And I looked at my girlfriend and I was like, don't mess with me right now <laughs> because I don't want this to go bad. What she started doing, she tickles me. <laughs> totally sent me into this like weird, just because it, it, it interrupted my bliss that I was experiencing, you know? So, low and slow, be able to track it, and don't use a product if it doesn't have a lab report. I don't care if it's flour, bake, this, that, whatever. Know what you're getting, know the extraction methods, know the infusion method, and that way you can track it because there's a lot of really, really bad products out there. Really bad products. And so the two things where you're gonna be using THC, you know, some type of ratio between THC and CBD? Uh, you can do THC by itself, which will activate your CB1 and CB2 receptors. Or you can then include CBD into the equation at various ratios, which acts as an antagonist to our CB1. So what it does is essentially modulates the effects of THC. So instead of you have that super, super head high, it now bounces it out kind of throughout the rest of the body. And then cannabidiol, which like I said earlier, has such a weak affinity for the receptors, it doesn't really bind with the receptors. But cannabidiol just by itself CBD, so forget THC, just an isolated form of THC. I said that's the miracle molecule, okay? Cannabidiol modulates our own endogenous cannabinoids, so it allows an anandamide and 2-AG to uh, basically allow the endocannabinoid to better put them to use, so to speak, but also everything, if the body creates something, it's got to either like, get rid of it or recycle it. So what happens is when, you, uh, uh, when the endocannabinoid releases uh, anandamide, there's something called FA, fatty acid hydrolase, and FA eats away an anandamide. Cannabidiol slows down FA from eating away an anandamide. So it essentially allows your endocannabinoid system to work more efficiently. And then, it, I forget the, it's like, it's super long, it's like M-A-G-L, whatever that, can't remember what it stands for, is the same enzyme that eats away 2-AG to arachnidoglycerol, um, and cannabidiol modulates that as well. But the fascinating thing about, absolutely fascinating thing about cannabidiol is it can modulate your gene expression. Okay, so we have, imagine your, body, your, your whole body is just this giant library, and there's a bunch of books in it, and every book is a, is a gene that can be expressed. You know, in a disease state, there's a lot of horror story books that are being expressed. And maybe not all the ones that are actually um, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, maybe they're being like, held down. Cannabidiol comes in and says, you folks need to just stop, go away, and shut up, and then we need you guys to come out. So it modulates your genetic expression. Uh, it also it modulates our neurotransmitters, um, GABA and uh, glutamate, especially glutamate, uh, which is causing a lot of, uh, you were shaking your head earlier, the uh, anxiety, depression, mood disorders, uh, epilepsy, uh, Parkinson's, this excitotoxicity of glutamate, and GABA bounces that, and when you don't have that balance, you have disease. So, um, cannabidiol comes in and, and, and down regulates the, uh, or the um, uh, glutamate. Uh, it also increases antioxidant production of uh, glutathione. Um, and that, that's something I read briefly, which I was fascinated by, and I, I 
I have to dig deeper to figure that out, but um, the ketogenic diet enhances glutathione, which is like our most important antioxidant, um, and you know minimizes uh, reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress and all these bad, bad things. And CBD is kind of like right there working on all of this. I, I truly feel that every single human being should be taking CBD. Even though, saying that, there are certain diseases where if you take THC, it can help, and then that same person with the same disease can take THC and it won't help. It can actually exasperate their symptoms. And that's where that bioimpedance scanning, I think, will be an effective tool for you to be able to come in. You don't like to feel psychoactive, but you have an issue. You come to me or Dr. John, and we sit you down and we go through your medical history, and we, we look at your, your symptoms and look at your goals. Look at what you like to feel or don't like to feel and figure out what your budget is. And now we say that based off of all of this, you know, this ratio may help you. We do a scan, you consume, do another scan, and we say, okay, well, based off of this, this helped. Okay? How do you feel? Better? Okay, well, feeling better is one thing, but seeing that you're better is another. And that's the other thing that's great because we just get you high on THC and you walk out of there and you're just like, man, this was a great doctor's visit. But it's actually hurting your symptom. You know, Epstein-Barr is a herpes virus. It's a chronic fatigue syndrome. THC, activating that CB1 receptor, it's great. Think about it. THC is high and euphoric. You have a chronic disease. But now you throw cannabidiol into that equation, which is modulating the effects of it, making you more mellow and relaxed. The last thing someone needs with a chronic disease symptom is to be more mellow and relaxed. Um, what was the other one I was looking up? Uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Autoimmune hepatitis needs the cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2 receptors activated, but with an antagonist at 1. So you need to activate this receptor, but then shut it down, so THC and CBD, while keeping the CD2 receptor activated which can be done through THC, because it does bind with both receptors, but also can be done by taking beta caryophyllene. So I have a, uh, a, a friend that I've been helping with their 12-year-old daughter who has autoimmune hepatitis. And there can, I basically found non-psychoactive whole plant extracts. And uh, as a parent with medical marijuana cars, and they have the ability and even have their doctors on board with this cannabinoid supplementation, and they ran the whole ratio and everything that I suggested, and the doctor's like, yeah, this sounds good. You know, and I'm really curious, uh, they're, they're slowly implementing things, reducing the gluten, reducing the sugar, kind of going more paleo as well, but she has digestive issues from it, she's got uh, anxiety, she's got irritability issues, like, she's a 12-year-old girl. That sucks. And they told her that they might have to give her a, a what is it, a, a kidney or liver transplant. Liver, right? Autoimmune hepatitis and yeah, yeah, liver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and she swallowed herself like it's terrible. And hopefully this will help, you know. But if it doesn't, it's like, well, this we tried with the plant. They've tried with modern medicine. They tried with the plant. If it doesn't happen from there. Like I don't, I don't know, you know. And that that's where I think that. Everything we talked about could have an effect, but I mean, how do you tell a 12 year old or a parent of a 12 year old to give your daughter some shrooms? <laughs> you know, or even just weed in general, you know? Wow, it's just said weed. I never refer to it as weed. <laughs> so. I have a question. Sure. Um, do you have any knowledge of the biosynthesis pathway of endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids? Because that's something that we've been really curious on, and admittedly, I haven't really scoured the internet, but. I know omega threes seem to be like um, a precursor in some way, but do you know anything about that pathway? Uh, so, from from what I know and from that momentous paragraph, is that we are the cell membrane, and, and this is where I'm like, this is the chef speaking <laughs> for sure. You know, um, I'm going off of memory here. I will research further, um, but from what I understand, are so anandamide is a mainly omega-3 base, but 2-AG is actually an omega-6 base. Mm, okay. And that, because they are fatty lipids. But the, the, like the receptor points, the CB receptors themselves are, the foundation of that is also omega-3 DHA. Um, so 
And then in the sense of how they're, they're released on demand. So this isn't like a stored anything. They're, they're released when you need it. And then, um, what's the word, catalyzed. Uh, so they're, uh, the enzymes follow the MALG or MAGL that is eating them uh, just gets rid of them once, once you're, you're, well, once those enzymes are activated. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but I, I, the, the entire process from, from when they're actually released to broken down, uh, there are cell, cell diagrams and imaging and stuff like that, and that's where I, it goes beyond me, and that's why, like, a part of this, I, I hope that I can meet other people in the research. Like, my dream at this point, whose dream is it to meet Dr. Raphael and Schulman? He's like 80 summer, 90 years old. I would love to. You know, I'm not worried about Lady Gaga. She's she, All right, maybe Dave Matthews I'd be really psyched about. Well, right? I just had like 8,000 8, people just unfollow me. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I can research this more. Uh, I'm curious about it as well. But I, it comes to the point in the research in these medical journals where I, I do need more help. Like, I, I want to learn more, but I feel that I need to partner with those who can, so my time can be spent on let's educate, 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 mm -hmm. and and then you guys feed me the information. So I have a friend of mine that's a doctor, he's a surgeon, uh, has been treating a stage four cancer patient uh, with marinol, which is the synthetic form of THC. He is a brilliant young doctor, young, like in his early 30s, which is a young doctor, you know, um, and it's not that he was necessarily against cannabis, he didn't necessarily understand it, he didn't really consume it at all growing up, he didn't even really drink that much, I mean, he was in med school, you know, for 38 years. <laughs> um, called me one day and said, told me the story of this, this, who's actually a retired minister, and he was in physically, you know, normal shape for, I guess it was 40s, I think he said. Um, and ended up uh, all of a sudden having a, a stomach issue, a cramp, or pain. Goes in, cancer from head to toe. Out, like, went from feeling totally normal to, ooh, what's that, to you have four months to live. So they were giving him Marinol, because they only give Marinol to people who are dying. Okay, so it's... It is, and for anyone that will see this, Marinol is a synthetic, which means it was a chemical that was created in a lab to mirror Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. And because it came from a lab, it is 100% legal and FDA approved as something that a doctor can write a prescription for. So the very thing that mirrors something that is a Schedule One controlled substance that has no medicinal benefits whatsoever, that comes from the ground, that very thing that mirrors it is totally legal. But it's also ridiculously expensive. So this patient, when it was released to the hospital, essentially go home and die, the insurance company said, we're not covering your Marinol anymore. So the only thing that was helping him sleep give him an appetite so he actually had an appetite to eat and have energy and minimize his pain in conjunction with the other treatments of uh, pain relievers and probably uh, uh, morphine or opiates. Uh, and they do work together, okay? So the only thing that was helping him do those things and feel better, they took away. So because of his zip code, he's gonna die suffering from cancer. Because of my zip code, I'm not going to get cancer. And if I do, because of environmental factors or things that I cannot control, I, because of my zip code, will have the ability to walk pretty much, I could drive within two to three minutes in, in various directions of my home right now and be at a dispensary. And I can go in there, show them my card, and get what I need. And at least have a better quality of life as I may be going down. But I'm not. I'm, it was it. Dave Asprey was a little bit, I think, to 104 years old, and he's the bulletproof. He's the face of bulletproof. He's a huge inspiration. Um, he's doing amazing things, and he wants to live to 140. I don't know if 140, because I've already done a lot of damage to myself <laughs> that I'm recovering from, but uh, I want to live a long, healthy, high quality life, but I want to have cognitive function and awareness throughout that. You know, I have a, a, a grandmother right now with dementia, 
And I don't know what I would have to do to get my family in New Jersey to adapt just this part, so just CBD, legal CBD, okay? Or get her a med card, because Jersey, they have medical, and do this combination instead of the living facility that's giving them hot dogs and tater tots for lunch. A bunch of sick, dying old people. Here's some fried tater tots. Like, what is going on, you know? Um, I, I, I definitely think that this could, could help. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tangenting at this point, so. Um, any other questions to, to, to wrap up? Cool. Well, it seems like we're probably uh, at the end of our time in the venue anyways. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, letting us be here, for sure. <laughs> and uh, to y'all who came, I really appreciate it. I know the issue with the website. Uh, I'm excited to get this information out here. Uh, I talk to myself in the shower practicing and thinking about these things and I get excited. So any size audience is, uh, is, is exciting for me. And if anyone has any questions, feel free, uh, reach out to me, follow me on Instagram, uh, at Chef Brand now, and that is where I do a lot of my, uh, my information. And I'm also, um, on, on, a, on a personal side, I'm very, very close, just about a phone call or an email away from basically being able to do this full time and completely focus all of my attention on the content online, educating people about cannabis and ketosis and everything else that I stumble across that is positively affecting my life. So I'm excited about that. Thanks. 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 Thanks.